Bujun and Dinwe Maganatuk, Melissa and Dijini Kaz, Mukunzi Gabui, Kidashin and Nago, and then Anishnabe Ikwe, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, and then Dunji Ba. Miu, Miigwech. I greeted you all as relatives. I introduced myself as an Anishinaabe woman, a uh, proud member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe, and I'm happy we're all together for this special afternoon. So thanks for coming. And I want to acknowledge a very special welcome to our Maori relatives who just got all the plane from Anishinaabe. And um, the fabulous Dr. Ella Henry, who you will have an opportunity to hear from, speaking on this very important panel, examining 50 years of resistance as indigenous peoples from Alcatraz to Mauna Kea and beyond. What do the next 50 years look like? So I'm just very delighted and honored, um, Dr. Ella, that you were able to make it. We have Dr. Uh, Pare Kea from Auckland University of Technology also here and why they are here in town is his mastermind and his lovely assistant Dr. Sharon Mazur from Auckland <laughs> University of Technology. Uh, they have putting they have been producing for the last four years? Three years. Three years. Three, three years. The Kahaka Maori and Indigenous Dance Performance Symposium. Did I get it right? Performance Studies. Performance Studies Symposium. And they have produced that for three years in Aotearoa in Auckland, New Zealand. And our wonderful faculty, uh, the wonderful Eddie Madrill and his lovely wife, Sarah Moncada Madrill, who is a dancer and vice president at the Cultural Conservancy. They uh, participated in Kahaka the first two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first two. So this is the first time the Kahaka Symposium is coming to Turtle Island, uh, to these mm -hmm. lands, to the Ramitush Ohlone lands on which we are on here. And always honor and recognize uh, the sovereignty of the Ramitush Ohlone, past, present, and future. And they will be doing protocols with our Ohlone guests tomorrow morning uh, in the Presidio. And you're all welcome to that as well. So that's why we have these special guests here. And then my amazing mastermind, um, the chair of our department, Dr. Joanne Barker, has been putting these together, these fabulous red talks, over the semester in honor of the 50th anniversary of Alcatraz, and wanted to conclude with this extraordinary scope of looking at what has happened as indigenous peoples from that historic moment to what's happening today in Hawaii on the Big Island with Mauna Kea, and of course we know it's happening sadly all around the world in indigenous territories in Bolivia, in the Arctic, uh, all over the place. So um, with that, I will say thank you for coming and um, really happy we're all together this afternoon. Thank you, thank you Melissa. <laughs> so um, I want to welcome everyone and again just acknowledge um, that we are in Ohlone territory and on Ohlone lands and that that's important to us as indigenous scholars and community members that we um, acknowledge those relationships but also the responsibilities that those relationships involve. And I also want to thank um, Dr. Nelson and Sarah and Eddie for um, connecting TCC and American Indian Studies and um, our colleagues from from New Zealand. Um, it's an honor to have you all here, and it's going to be a good conversation. I also want to thank my fellow presenters for, especially Ella, who just got off the plane <laughs> 15 hours, <laughs> flying and running to campus. So um, thank you very much. It's really an honor to uh, be able to speak with you today and thank a little bit. Um, and so, you know, this is our last Red Talk this semester. Um, we've had quite um, a number of just really amazing discussions. And it's been such um, an honor to welcome Indigenous people to campus and to think about issues from, you know, yesterday we were just discussing with an alum of ours who's Anida and, and Latina. Uh, who's now, she graduated from here in 2005, and she's now um, an assistant professor of sociology at Virginia Tech, 
and she's working, um, collaborating with a colleague uh, on police violence um, against Native communities here in the U.S. and linking that violence to um, the removal of children in ways that are just really powerful and important. Um, we've also had a couple of performances from our colleague John Carlos Perea. Uh, he, that's where he was just before our talk, so he's probably decompressing now. Um, we've had talks on missing and murdered indigenous women and California Indian land acknowledgement politics. And so um, we wanted to conclude by thinking about sort of transnational issues. Um, marking uh, this particular semester is important here in the College of Ethnic Studies because it's the 50th anniversary of the founding of the college, and so the beginning of American Indian Studies here. But it's also the 50th anniversary of the occupation of Alcatraz. And so we think um, in our department that it's important that we think together about the pedagogy and educational demands of our activism and what those relationships are and why it's important historically that the founding of the college and this political action in the city, right, that leads to um, the formation. It, it, people often talk about it as an AIM event, but it wasn't. It was, right, it was Native people here in California, um, of California and in, in California, who organized Alcatraz. And so, thinking about how that folded into this broader national uh, and international movement around indigenous rights, really grounded in treaty struggles um, and addressing the, their rights on unceded treaty lands. And so what does that mean? Um, both historically and in our relationships to people in the Pacific, because uh, we often forget that the United States um, occupies not just Turtle Island, but Hawaii and many, many places in the Pacific and the Caribbean mm -hmm. that, right, that the sort of changing of land title between European powers back in the 1800s that, that is part of our legacy together. And so just to think about what those, those broader histories mean. Um, so what I, my, my role uh, uh, today is to spend a very quick summary of five key occupations, indigenous occupations, since, including Alcatraz, since Alcatraz, um, in the US and Canada, leading up to Mauna Kea, which I will then turn over to our colleague, and then um, ask a couple of questions about how these quote unquote occupations matter um, in our histories and relationships with each other. And, um, it is occupation what we need when we talk about this history. So just to think critically about this concept of indigenous peoples occupying their own land. <laughs> like what is that? And what does that mean and how, how can we think about that? So I wrote some dates on the board. They made me write them over there so that they're off camera. But <laughs> I'm just outing our camera people. Um, <laughs> they have power. That's right. They are. They're very bossy. So if if you would, if you're like me, and there's just too many dates in the world, um, uh, it helps to have them written out. I could have done a PowerPoint, but I didn't. We have people That's in the hall. Come in. Come. Grab yeah. something to drink and to eat. Come Thank you. Come in, anywhere Yes, welcome. Our lot. Come on in. Come on in. Come in. Oh, no worries. Sit anywhere you want. It's all good. It's all good. Oh. <laughs> no, she won't look up. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to talk very uh, briefly, give broad overviews of these specific events, 
Um, and then I'm also going to ask those of you in the audience, our students and other faculty, to fill in um, details about the importance of these events, things that they think about when we talk about Alcatraz or Anasatake or Standing Rock or Saborte. And then um, I'm going to show you a brief uh, documentary, 20 minute documentary, that just came out last week from indigenous peoples in British Columbia about their um, uh, reoccupying of their treaty lands to stop another pipeline from going through another trans mountain extension. Um, it's a really great documentary, and I think it'll help prompt us, right, to think about our relationships to each other, especially because they're thinking really critically about not just these temporary sort of we're here and now we're gone, but actually how to re. Um, rematriate the land to the people, right? So Alcatraz was from November 20th, 1969 to June 11th, 1971. There were, I think officially they say 89 Indian people who were there. Um, the population really fluctuated over that period of time. The core leadership kind of formed itself as the Indians of all tribes, and they're still around today. They're in the Bay Area, and they're, they're organizing a host of events um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, but they uh, included Richard Oakes, who was a student here um, at San Francisco State. Uh, they included uh, Lanada Means, who is now um, War Jack, who just spoke here weeks ago, um, John Tudell and many others um, who uh, served in, in various leadership roles during that time, including you know the different councils that kind of took care of people at the island. Um, the, the island was um, declared, uh, the penitentiary is closed there, the prison is closed in 1963. And a year later, the island is declared what they call surplus federal property. Mm. So what that meant was that in a many, many treaties throughout the United States, but specifically the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty between the United States and the Lakota, Erpaho, and Cheyenne people, Abandoned buildings, federal buildings, could be repurposed by the tribe, right? They could use them. So they used this, this specific treaty, but really that kind of treaty provision, to claim the island during that time. And it's a very, very um, significant uh, moment in. Um, Native history within California and for California Indians because it served as a kind of catalyst organizing in this period of time. But to talk a little bit more about the significance, I thought I would ask others in the audience if you had what your perceptions of the importance about the Alcantara's occupation was before I make any more comments about it. Why, why does it matter? Well, I think it acted as a um, foundation to spur other issues and, and other um, tribal communities around the country to right. stand up. And I know two down in Southern California, um, right in that year, mm -hmm. the, um, I think it was only a two-day occupation of the um, Southwest Museum in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one escapes me, other, uh, but so it, it, it was that um, kind of that kick that we needed to get things really started, you know, at a, at a larger level, because it was very, publicized. Right. Everybody knew about it. Um, so that being that it was okay to be native and it was okay to stand up for your rights. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. I think that happened in a major city, a major area, and it was a catalyst, it was the, the media, and I think it was also the relationship that people started seeing between American and people who weren't fighting emotionally but actually fighting with intellect and with historical documents between our people and their people that agreed on this, and, and it stands as being, it holds true as fact and in law, federal law, right. and uh, to see the relationship that was being you know, witnessed by hundreds of thousands across the United States through the media going, 
So they're saying no, but they're going ahead and giving you some other places somewhere else, but just not Alcatraz. Because there's uh, the property up north. Um, Yakama. Yeah, Yakama. Uh, Yakama. Yakama, yeah. right? Yakama yeah. property. Is there. How about that one? How about DQ? How about these other ones? Yeah, but Alcatraz too. And everybody across the country is like, well, how come they're just not getting it? Because somebody with power doesn't want that to happen. And again, like you were saying, you know, it was a good time. It was actually be a good time. It was an easier time to be native in the late 60s and early 70s when everybody else was having long hair and beads, I guess. Um, and so it was a little bit easier, and people were seeing a lot of the strife and the, the, the success and the, the not successes between civil rights. And there was just a big eyesore in the country for people to see normal human beings trying to get what's just right there before their eyes as being legal and them seeing that somebody with power saying no. Yeah. The other one was the um, takeover of San Miguel Mission. And so there was, it was, I can't remember how long it was, um, right. but there were maybe four Native men that, that took it over. And it was under a law or a decree that said the same kind of thing, that if the church is not utilizing um, the grounds, um, or actually it was based on when Natives become civilized, mm -hmm. was the law. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they occupied and they took it to court, <laughs> and they won, and the judge asked them, well, what makes you think you're civilized? And they said, well, we drive cars, you know, we wear your clothes, and we got syphilis. Because that's what you have when you came here. That's what your identity of civilized was. So right. we're here, and they got granted the land. Right. They sold it back to the mission for like $40,000 and bought land um, up at the mountains and created a community there. <laughs> and I believe that law still stands on the books. But for some reason, nobody wants to go with me to take over a mission. <laughs> so if anybody's in the room, right after this talk, we'll go into it. Well, you filmed that, but not those, huh? Yeah. Just yeah. teasing. I mean, I think what's so interesting about Alcatraz is that it was so important to indigenous people because it really did sort of mark a moment of reasserting, right, treaty rights and an identity that wasn't a victim, right? We were reclaiming, and then the humor that surrounded, you know, Trudell's radio show and the talking points they issued and stuff, that, that it really marked, and the families, the fact that there were families there and children, and that it, it none of it conformed to the stereotype of who Indian people were, and I think it, it mattered. So even though they left the island and, it was, um, you know, they didn't get the island or the, the building. It had so much other importance for Indian people. So um, the next moment I want to just uh, mark is the Kanasatake, or what is often historicized as the Oka crisis. So how many of you don't know anything about Kanasatake, the 1990? Oh, okay. So, um, okay. So the Kanasatake are one of several Mohawk uh, reservations in the US and Canada. And this particular reserve, um, or acres of land, it, that was contended, is right near this city of Oka, which is in the province of Quebec, okay? It's a long, complicated history. So there were nine square miles near adjacent, depending on who you, owned by uh, a seminary, a Catholic seminary. It had been part of church lands. In um, uh, 1717, um, Quebec's governor, the, uh, I didn't write his name down, oh well. Um, he uh, recognizes that the Mohawk have vested rights in this land and that the land includes what are often called by the Mohawk people the pines or the sacred pines because it's a burial area, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I won't go through all the details of, of the legal stuff except to move you forward to um, 1977 when the Kanasatake file a land claim. And what they're trying to do is to get Parliament, so the Canadian Parliament, to recognize their title to that land, and you know they do the historical back to 1717, to um, stop development because Oka is on that, that area. 
their land claim is rejected in 1986. So in 1989, a golf course who had nine holes near this area um, proposes to extend another nine holes, so they're going to double the size of the golf course. They're going to set up housing and a big parking lot and all this kind of stuff in there. They don't consult with the Mohawk because they say Mohawk land rights were nullified by the court, right, by the land claim um, denial. So um, by the following year, the Kanesatake go, you know, okay, enough. <laughs> we, have, um, we have legal rights to this land, but we also have um, a deep responsibility to protect this land from development. And so they begin, they build uh, various, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, Barrier. Barriers, thank you. <laughs> uh, to the roads, to the bridge, the, the only um, tra you know, uh, transportation line uh, to Oka from that side, they, they, they occupy the bridge, they, uh, they try to stop the development um, plans. <clears throat> Quebec and Canada throw the military at them. I mean, it's pretty vicious. So during this time, there's actually some great work by um, Alanisa Bomsawin, um, Kanesataki 270 Years of Resistance. You can watch it for free, I believe, still on the National Film Board of Canada's website, along with a number of her other films. She goes for the whole time. She's in her early 60s at this moment. She's out there with the camera. Um, her sound crew comes and goes because it's pretty scary. Um, and there's, there's some pretty violent clashes between the police, the military, and the Kanesatake. And at the end of it, they decide to exit this particular area um, and to let it go, uh, uh, to stop the, the demonstration. Um, and again, this gets narrated as a big defeat. But for the Mohawk, it wasn't a defeat at all. Um, it was their decision to leave. It was, they had, they had made a statement. There's all these stories, too, about the local towns, um, the racism towards Mohawk people. It's pretty intense. And, mm. and uh, a lot of you know, stuff that was going on around, around the action. But in September of 1990, they decide to, um, to, to sort of end it. And they're arrested, um, they go to court. Um, uh, many, of the, many of the charges end up getting dropped, but not without right, the kind of bullying that, that the US and Canada are, are very good at of Native activists. The, um, the golf course is expansion is canceled um, after negotiations between um, various ministers in Indian Affairs and uh, the Justice Department with OCA. Uh, they cancel the expansion and they Canada sets aside $5.3 million to secure the land. They don't give title, of course, to the Mohawk, but they hold it in trust for the Mohawk. So, um, but all of the other things that the Mohawk asked for in terms of redress of military violence and things like this are not sort of, um, there's no attention to that. Um, okay, so colleagues in the room, uh, anything else that you think is important about that specific action at Kamasataki? Yes. Well, it really made national news in Canada and the United States in a major way. I mean, I was in, I was born during Alcatraz, so I didn't get to witness that, but it was the first time I witnessed some uh, an occupation of that size and caliber taking place in North America that got national public attention. And again, just like I'm sure Alcatraz, it inspired so many people to really stand up for our rights again and really protect our sacred places. So I think it had a galvanizing effect for sacred land protection. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget just one photo. Oh yeah. 
if there's just one photo of that event that makes you just go, I just need to learn about this again. And it's the one of the Mohawk with the bandana across his face, the military mm -hmm. hat. Looking downward at a military soldier from Canada, just looking going, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and just that one photo itself is so moving and it's, it's so powerful that you can't help but want to and need to learn about it. Is that one image? I, I lived in New York for a little while back in the mid-90s, and I remember Mohawk women talking about the women's council, councils that were directing the action, and that they never end up on the camera, but they were the ones, the, the, the women's uh, leadership were the ones who were directing, and um, they were the ones who made the decision about, about the withdrawal. So I do think it has this kind of cultural significance, right? Or, Mm -hmm. For the Mohawk and for people who who uh, were paying attention to what was happening there, and that's always the problem with history, right? They sort of pay attention to. We used to joke in L.A. about the shades and braids of Indians, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and they never know the richer sort of complicated histories of all the things that were happening to among Indigenous peoples to support them during that time. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go into two, oh well, first I'm going to do Saborite. So in between April and July of 2011, uh, Indian People Organizing for Change, which is a group that operates out of Oakland, um, and is co it's been around since the 70s, it's co-directed by an Ohlone woman named Karina Gould, and a Benoc um, Shoshone Banach woman, Janella Rose, and they um, responded to, so the city of Vallejo owns this park and they wanted to do a bunch of expansion. And they say, no, this is one of the few remaining shell mound sites. And there's been um, University of California at Berkeley's archaeology department had done a lot of illegal excavations there. There's thousands of human remains and cultural mm -hmm. objects that are at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, you cannot take any more out of our, our sacred site, our burial site, our, our village site, our shell mound. And so they occupied for um, 109 days in 2011. Um, this specific site that they call Sigorte uh, or Glen Cove in, uh, in, in near Vallejo and or in Vallejo and we're in con you know sort of in um, conflict with both the city and the park service there who really wanted to do this development and um, this action ended because the city sort of made some promises and the park service made some promises to do consultation and uh, they didn't realize that behind the scenes a federally recognized tribe had, had kind of reached an agreement with them um, basically granting them permission to do the development so the Ohlone are there's no Ohlone people in the Bay Area that are that have recognition status which means um, government and cities are not required, states are not required <coughs> to consult with them. Mm -hmm. So they turned to a tribe that, that kind of gave them permission to do it. And so there's some, there, there was some real um, uh, bad things that happened in, at the end of that specific um, occupation. But one of the really amazing things that happened out of it was the formation of the Saborte Land Trust. And this is, um, you can go to their website. They're a group that organize in um, the traditional Ohlone territory in that area, Chichenyo and um, Karkin Ohlone. And they are um, working to create really specific land trusts where Ohlone people, they're not interested in recognition at the state or federal level, but they do want to be able to care for the land. And so they already have now two sites and are working on a third. Um, they're smaller sites. They've partnered with Planting Justice, which has kind of a farm area. Um, and they have a, a, an area there where they have a, they've rebuilt um, an 
Arboretum and some, you know, have planted some seeds and have done a lot of work there. And now they have a night in, um, in West Oakland uh, at 30th and Linden. Um, it's a small garden, but they're kind of, their, their goal is to just piece together, right, slowly uh, space within this urban landscape um, to stave off development and to continue their, their traditional practices. So, um, and there's a documentary uh, called Beyond Recognition that's directed by um, Michelle Steinberg um, that uh, Dr. Nelson and I were involved in um, consulting and, and also because we both sit on the board, the Segorte um, Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I'm not going to do too much with Standing Rock because I think most of you probably have heard about Standing Rock, know about Standing Rock, were involved in actions in support of Standing Rock. Um, I was there for ten days in in one of a, a very at a very difficult moment. It occurs between April of 2016 and March of 2017. Um, and it just involved a lot of shenanigans on the part of the government. Um, we had almost had the um, permitting process, which did not follow consultation properly, um, uh, called into question and sort of on hold until fuller uh, EPA studies could be conducted. And um, our new administration came in and sort of green-lighted the whole thing. For those of you who don't know, there's been a huge spill last week uh, at, along there, mm -hmm. along that pipeline. It's um, <coughs> all of the claims that the land didn't matter and wasn't culturally relevant, just complete denial of both Lakota, that the Lakota talk about this area as unceded treaty territory. Um, and, uh, uh, and as culturally relevant, that up and down that river there are burial grounds and old village sites and sites that are really important within their history. And um, so all of that that happened during Standing Rock, I think, was really important. But I thought that in thinking about pipelines, we'd look to something a little less familiar. It's happening up in British Columbia. And So I don't want to say too much more. I just want to return to the questions I started with, which is how do these moments matter to us as indigenous people? And is occupation what we mean when we talk about returning to the land? Um, so I will now turn it over to my colleague. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Did you want me to answer the question or do my presentation? Do your questions. <laughs> um, sorry, but I will need a computer. Is that all right? Yes. That I can of course. Plug my wife. I can do this for you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but first, before I start, let me just um, stand up to acknowledge uh, the people of this land. I think it's Ohlone, is it? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. But all the other First Nations present, um, in the words of my ancestors, um, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto. I greet you three times. The first greeting is my greeting to you, Tena Koto. The second greeting is my ancestors greeting your ancestors, Tena Koto. My third greeting is my unborn descendants greeting your unborn descendants. Mm. Tēnā koutou, mm. tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, and um, now um, I'm going to open a thingy that says, so many thingies that say little. Um, but let's start with that. It's a little, just a little video. Um, it's just a few minutes. It was done on a Mac, but it's it's just a little MP4, so theoretically it should. Oh, can we stop it? Do we get it all thing? Now, sorry. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so these are these are not very flash images. Um, these are 
these are taken from the net images, but um, we can go back to the one before there's a... No, no, no. Sorry. Just, just bring it to the beginning. So I'm just going to shut up for three and a half minutes. Yeah. Let's do that. into the context of the genesis of um, activism throughout our indigenous peoples. But I just thought we'd start with a song. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, I think, I did a, a PowerPoint presentation um, primarily because as I plummet towards my dotage, I found that I lose track. <laughs> and so PowerPoint slides keep me on track. Otherwise, we could be here for days. Um, so this is, this is that, that little talk. Sorry, sociologists. Um, <laughs> from the University of Auckland, and both went to running with Walker's lectures who taught me in 1988 in his class that kafafai tonu mato, as indigenous people, we are engaged in struggle with our end. 
Um, but that does not mean that it always has to be without a sense of passion and pride and humour. Um, so, as I said here, that this is a little snapshot of who we were. Uh, we are one of the peoples of the Pacific, my cousin from the other part of the Pacific. We are all part of the same people. Uh, and what we've learned from our 3,000 year history, because whilst your continent is Turtle Island, our continent without curiosity and without resilience. So this is the heart of us. Yeah. And we know we're explorers. In New Zealand, we name every, every single mountain and river has a name and a story that connects us to it. We also know we're very entrepreneurial, very innovative, open to change and adaptation. Mm -hmm. Again, these are the survival skills yeah. of First Nations all around the world. And underpinning all of that is a sense of connection. That's, that's the heart of us, is our connection. We are more than individuals, we are connected as family, but we are connected to the land, we are connected to the rivers, we are connected to the ocean. They own us, we do not own them. They care for us, we do not conquer them. Mm. Uh, you know, so that's, that's who we are. So we bring that to our idea. Oh, she's, she's, I used to live with this lovely statue when I worked at another institution. The interpretation and the wording of what was signed and what was given up have formed the basis of a profoundly negative colonial experience for Māori. So the British argued, we give it all away. <laughs> Such fabulous looking people, I'm just going to give you all of it. Um, and we argued, no, we, we, we wanted to share. So uh, we know from history that the era of colonisation has proven to be absolutely catastrophic. And among some of the examples, just between 1840 and 1900, when I would suggest that in 1900 was probably the nadir of Māori existence, when we could conceivably have become as extinct as the dodo. Our population was so small and the population that was left was um, in dire straits. Uh, but within a matter of years of signing the treaty, breaches occurred. Um, the, 19, uh, eight, sorry, the 1852 New Zealand Constitution Act gave settlers the right to govern. Mm. And then it really turned to shit for us. Uh, because after that, they had the absolute power of legislative privilege. And so some uh, legislation was enacted that led eventually to the land wars of the 1850s, um, one response from Māori was the creation of the Kingitanga, a Māori-led political movement. But really, particularly after the war in Taranaki, uh, we had been reduced. And that's 35 years from when we were the top traders in the South Pacific mm -hmm. to, to a broken, in many ways, broken people. Um, massacre, confiscation of land, and the, the, the loss of our economic foundations has really proven to be uh, the most destructive outcome of the colonial experience. And I'm not telling you fellas anything that you are not aware of in your own world, but it does show that uh, there's been a long history of disadvantage which Māori have had to find our way through. However, uh, some interesting things occurred in the 20th century. Uh, we, we were part of the civilising agenda, you know, banning our language in schools, um, banning our traditional healers, uh, a whole range of legislation was enacted which was designed to turn us into civilised Western folk. Um, the great assimilation agenda. Our population was decimated, as you said, but syphilis was amongst them, uh, whooping cough, measles, you know, a complete inability to cope with the diseases of the West, combined with the growing poverty that came out of the loss of our economic foundations, saw us really broken in so many communities. And, and whereas only a hundred years earlier, the outside world, what we call Pākehā, uh, New Zealanders of European descent or non Māori, who would come to our country on our terms, and a hundred years later, we are working for them. Yeah. You know, we, are, we, we are living in our lands on their terms. And that's, that's a big swing uh, for people to cope with. 
uh, we, we survived the Great Depression, or as my mother used to say, we didn't even notice it in the far north. They just said there was a thing called the Depression. Mm -hmm. It was just the same as usual. Mm -hmm. Followed by World War II, we lost a generation of warriors and leaders. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, after World War II, is the massive uh, post-war urban migration and industrial boom came together, uh, we started moving to the cities, and I am certainly um, a part of that generation who was brought to the city as a child um, 60 years ago. Um, we entered education and professions, and the discontent about uh, how our history had been really anesthetized, I guess the only thing you can talk, say, the word, you know, it's, it's, it, it, we were supposed to be the land of great race relations, which was fantastic until we moved in next door. <laughs> then, not so much. Yeah. Um, and so that was very much the world that I came from, where I came from a, a, a rural little community where everybody spoke Māori, and then, as I said, in 1960, which is um, 60 years ago, moved to a, a place where I was the only brown kid and put up with all of the epithets that you put up with when you're the only brown kid, mm -hmm. um, which resulted in all sorts of, you know, weird trauma that I dealt with in the 70s, <laughs> which as I said before, if you remember the 70s, you missed the point. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> <laughs> what also emerged in the 70s is what Rangi Nui Walker, our great teacher, taught us, is the revitalization of Māori language and culture. As more of us moved to the cities, we left our traditional homelands and so much of our identity behind. But what we also were able to do was create new worlds. Our young Māori entered education in unprecedented numbers, and they were often the architects and the storytellers of the truth of our history. That anger that emerged in the 70s was part of a groundswell of anger around the world. AIM, Black Panthers, Women's Liberation, Band of Bomb. It was kind of like the disenfranchised of the world woke up in the 60s. And by the 70s, we'd figure, it, figure out how to strike back. So the genesis of Māori activism, I think, is a part of a global movement, uh, which has both positive and negative side effects. Um, but certainly in New Zealand, a number of interesting uh, events occurred. Ngā Tamatō, which means Young Warriors, was a group of uh, young folk, half of them are now members of parliament, or ex-members of parliament, but at the time, they were the face of young Māori activism. The Te Reo Māori petition was submitted to parliament, I believe, in 1973. Was it 36 or 60,000 people? Somebody here will know more than me. Oh, Tens of thousands of people signed a petition to have our language taught in schools. You wouldn't think that would be a big thing, but it was. Um, Māori Landmarch of 1975, the image of the old woman and the child, that was Dame Finna Cooper, mm -hmm. who in her 80s led that march. Um, Bastion Point. So these are not the only things, but these are some of the high profile ones. Bastion Point <coughs> was the occupation of land and why it gained international recognition is it, was, it happened in Auckland, our biggest city, and Bastion Point, the people of the, the tribe, this is just an aside, but uh, in 1951, I was told by the organiser of Bastion Point, um, in 1951, Joe Hawke and his father, because uh, he was a boy then, were up <coughs> above their traditional village mm. when um, police and military turned up and moved everybody out of the village and burnt the village down. And the reason they burnt the village down is because this village was on beautiful seashore. Mm -hmm. And the plan had been that the new Queen Elizabeth was due to visit the country the following year. And the last thing they wanted was dirty savages living like natives on this beautiful, pristine piece of beach frontage. So they just moved them out and burned it all down. And that was 1951. So we're not talking about an ancient and long-standing history. But it, what, it, what these things did was they raised the profile of Māori activism. The Springbok Tour, those of you who are supremely un, uninterested in rugby, I get it. 
but I come from a country that was colonized by people who would, in their own country, never have been able to own land, who came and stole my country, and then adopted all the mannerisms of rich white men. So I come from a country where we play rugby and cricket. <laughs> the folly of rich white men are the sports that we play. The delicious irony is that we play it better than them. <laughs> 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 so, we've taken over rugby. <laughs> we're working on cricket. <laughs> uh, but, but we were the last country in the world to continue sporting links with South Africa until 1981. Uh, then in, in 1984, a new Labour government came into power and they gave the Waitangi Tribunal the body to set up to address grievances of the treaty. They gave them the power to look retrospectively to 18. 40, and for the first time, Māori were actually able to take out grievances to a body. It did not have the power <coughs> to uh, control government, but it could make recommendations. But the revitalisation of language and culture of that Māori renaissance came out of being able to actually air out grievances, but also develop strategies for how we were going to do that. And Kōpapa Māori uh, is a a name for, but more importantly, a philosophy that has gained traction in the in the political and academic world. And so I just want to take a few seconds because what for me Copa Pomari means is I do not know why you oh your battery is very low. <laughs> I know. Some of that sugary stuff. Yeah, a cookie. Do you, do you want a cookie? I'm in, you know, rhetorical swing. Um, so thank you. Um, so the revitalization of language and culture. I just want to take this um, to another slide, only because these are principles that have been developed by other scholars over the last 30, nearly 40 years, but they are also really useful tools philosophical tools for being able to critically self-analyze what you're doing and also to look at activism in the 21st century. Because um, as a number of scholars have said, you know, by within for Māori, by within for us is a really critical way of, of, of being able to move forward and achieve. However, increasingly, we have a number of non-Indigenous, non-Māori people walking alongside us. And I think that that is important as well because they are there to serve the kaupapa, the agenda. They're not there so that uh, we can be their servant. They are there because they are prepared to walk with us. Um, validating our language and culture, being able to, you know, and not all of us are at the same place in our language journey. Certainly with Te and I know a number of other indigenous languages are, are, are literally so fragile they're on the threshold of extinction. But that does not mean we cannot continue to work out ways to incorporate them, to acknowledge them, to weave the culture into our practice um, as part of who and what we are. Um, because those things, I believe, contribute to what I call economic sovereignty. So we talk about political sovereignty, which is important. And I think it is important, but without economic sovereignty as well, in other words, you know, how do we utilize the resources and how do we grow the resources and how do we take control of them um, as, is as important for our cultural well-being. Because all of those things together strengthen identity. And for us as Māori, that identity is woven into who and what we are because the smallest social unit is the family, not the individual. Um, the whānau, the family, the sub-tribe, the tribe, the community, as many of us who live in urban environments now do not have as much time as we might have in the past in our tribal communities, but that does not make us any less Māori. And I know that this is part of the struggle of many communities in uh, you know, Ontario Island are, are dealing with this. How do you deal with the disparate identities of being Indigenous? There, you know, are, are we going to put more barriers between those who are on the land and those who are in the cities? And um, I've got to say, just as a side, I just learned what I learned in the last year about Alcatraz by reading um, Tommy Orange's book there. Yeah. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So much of that book 
resonated for me as a Māori and explained what was happening for many of our Māori youth who, who are lost, you know, who, and, and who can so easily be co-opted by other um, communities, you know, and we have a huge gang problem, we have a huge prison population, of all of those negatives, and so I get how 21st century colonisation is still real, it's still a thing, and it's still impacting on our most vulnerable by, by, by providing them with alternative identities. So, so strengthening that, that identity through family and community is such a fundamental part of the revitalisation and renaissance agenda. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, this is, this is for me the genesis. We have a long history of activism and protest that goes back over 100, nearly 150 years. Um, however, we are a resilient and adaptive people who have an overweening aspiration for self-determination. Self-determination and, and empowerment um, are so critical to our well-being, but at the end of the day, we also have to be able to put the self self-determination. It's not just a political agenda, it's a social agenda, it's a cultural agenda. And, and all of those aspects of empowerment and, and freedom are tied up in the struggles that we all are part of and support. And so any opportunity to come together uh, in, a, in a wider international context contributes, I think, to that idea of um, empowerment, you know, because for me, it's really about drawing on the past, walking the talk of my ancestors is, is a, a thing, mm -hmm. so that I can transform the present and build a stronger future. Mm -hmm. wow. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Without my glasses, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh. <laughs> Should we pass around some food? Oh, yum. <laughs> 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 yeah. Pass around some food. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
just the rich history that you shared with us today. Um, as uh, Dwayne said, uh, I am, uh, my name is Pony Patrick, I am from Fiji, and uh, I am an indigenous Fijian. And we call <coughs> us, uh, like the Maoris, we call ourselves the Ita OK. Uh, so I'm an Ita OK from Fiji. And uh, before I uh, share uh, whatever that I have, I would also like to pay my acknowledgement to the Olyumi Kaolin tribe, uh, the native people of uh, the land uh, with which we now stand. I was giving acknowledgement to the people of this land, mm. the indigenous mm. people mm. of this land. And to us as indigenous people, it is very important that we pay respect and give the acknowledgement to the owners of the land, because we are owners of the land from where we come from. And we know how important it is uh, to be a, a visitor uh, to another place. And that is something that is completely devoid by the colonizers. Mm. They come in with no sense of uh, um, consciousness that mm -hmm. the place that they discovered and the place that they have seized is owned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so today, as we uh, uh, commemorate, you know, uh, the 50th anniversary of the College of Ethnic Studies, and in particular the Red Talk that we are doing today, I would like to share experiences from both Hawaii and Fiji. I must say that. Uh, um, uh, I'm only uh, talking about Mauna Kea as an Itauke, uh, talking about the importance of what it means to, to uh, what it means to indigenous Fijians, the, the notion of sacredness, and what it means to indigenous Fijians. But before I do that, I just want to very briefly talk about uh, Fiji. Um, <coughs> uh, on 10th of October last month, uh, Fiji uh, commemorated 49th year of political independence. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the you know country that was uh, um, colonized very late on in the, in the 19th century, in 1874. Uh, Australia uh, was uh, you know, colonized in 1788. New Zealand in 1874. Uh, in 1840, and Fiji in 1876. Mm -hmm. um, these experiences, both Australia, the, the Australian Aborigines, the Maoris of New Zealand, and the Itauke of Fiji experience the same thing, and that is land dispossession. And this is something that I think is important for us to focus on, that when we talk about colonization, that the dispossession of indigenous people of their land is, is, is the prime project of the colonizer. It's first and foremost a colonial project, land dispossession. And so uh, after 96 years of British colonial rule in Fiji, Fiji transitioned to political independence. And by the time the, you know, the British left, the British had already put in place a lease, an institutional leasing arrangement mm -hmm. that guaranteed the systematic leasing of the best prime land to corporations and to non-indigenous people. And that institutional leasing arrangement still stands today. Now, the Australian Aborigines you know, the Australian Aborigines. They lost their land through just complete land seizure. The British came and took it away and used the notion of terra nullus to legitimize that expropriation. In the case of New Zealand, it was either purchased or confiscated. In the case of Fiji, it was neither confiscated, nor purchased, nor seized, but it was leased. It's a different kind of dispossession. When you read the literature, the colonial literature, the critical colonial literature, or, or the discussion of critical colonialism, you will see that Fiji is venerated as, a, as an exceptional case. That despite colonization, the Intauke of Fiji transitioned with their indigeneity intact, with their land protected, and with the sense, with, with the fact that when you look at, you know, the post-colonial development, indigenous Fijians of the Intauke dominated the political scene in most of our post-colonial period. Mm -hmm. And so that gives the illusion that, wow, indigenous Fijians are, are, are special. Mm -hmm. That despite colonization, notwithstanding British colonialism, they came out, they survived. 
And that is not true. Indigenous Fijian had different kind of dispossession through lease. They have a different kind of oppression that may not be apparent, subtle. But you know, you know, the more subtle, when the colonial impact is subtle, it is deadly. Mm. At least the Kanaka Maori and the Maoris knew that they were dispossessed of their land. Indigenous features don't know that. They believed in the illusion that the land is theirs. When the British had already put in place a system of leasing arrangement that effectively dispossessed indigenous Fijians of their land, not through land seizure, not through confiscation, not through purchase, but through institutional leasing arrangement. Perpetual leasing arrangement. It's a perpetual lease, 99 years, and then another 99 years. And so here you have, you know, as we commemorate and reflect on the, you know, 49 years of political independence in Fiji, Fiji and the Itauke are still economically underdeveloped, marginalized, dispossessed, and the worst thing is that they are ignorant of their dispossession. See, this is, this is something that we don't often talk about in critical colonial discussion. We talk about, yes, we are dispossessed, the Maoris are dispossessed, the Kanaka Maori, the Kanaks of New Caledonia, the Native American Indians. There is a recognition that dispossession has taken place and we talk about it. In the case of Fiji, it's worse because indigenous Fijians do not know that they are dispossessed of their land. And they think of people like me as crazy. <laughs> Because I talk about dispossession, mm. and, 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 and you know, I, I say that just to um, to preface my uh, sort of what I wanted <laughs> to say about uh, Mauna Kea. You know, we um, when we talk about Mauna Kea, the native Hawaiians are the kind of I have I have three uh, you know uh, remarks that I wanted to say about that, and then um, sort of um, after saying that. I will try to sort of uh, juxtapose it with the case of the Etau K of Fiji. Um, the native Hawaiians and the Kanak Maui, when we talk about Mauna Kea, these are the three things that I want to say about Mauna Kea. The native Hawaiian or the Kanak Maui are not opposed to technology or science. Mm -hmm. Hawaiians have a long and illustrious tradition of, adopt, of, of adopting Western technologies. In fact, King Kalakaua, for instance, had electricity in his palace before the White House had. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the second thing I want to say about Mauna Kea is that the discussion for the saga about Mauna Kea illustrate conflictual perceptions. We all know this. The conflict between two ways of knowing, two ways of being, the conflict of epistemologies and cosmologies. Sacredness is just not a concept to the Kanaka Maori or to any indigenous people in this room and elsewhere. It is the lived experience of oneness and connectedness to the natural and the spiritual world. Mm. Mauna Kea represents conf conflictual perspectives on places, spaces, and time. Indigenous versus the modern. Space that is sacred because of what it represents which is the intersection between the physical and the spiritual, the histories, the genealogies, mm -hmm. the cosmologies and the epistemologies of a people, versus space, the perception that when you look at a space, you look at time, and you look at a place, it is for commercial exploitation and commercial, ex uh, commercial exploitation and astronomical or scientific exploration. It's a conflictual perspective on space and time. And places. And the third thing I want to say is that the evolution, what you see in Mauna Kea, the fact that the Kanaka Maori are asserting themselves, are fighting, to me is the evolution of a people, the evolution of self-determination of a people to be visible, to assert, and to protect what is left of their heritage mm -hmm. from colonization and from the capitalist economic system that thrives on the exploitation of human and natural resources for profit, the rule of law that protects and promotes white capitalists and white privileges, mm -hmm. and an economic system that also thrives in private property rights. Um, 
you know, those are uh, the things, my, those are my reflections on the moment here. And, uh, you know, um, Ella and uh, both Ella and Joanne talk about the concept of economic sovereignty, you know, economic sovereignty. Mm -hmm. In the case of PG, we have political sovereignty. Because when you look at, you know, um, the 49 years of our post-colonial development, it was dominated by Itoke-led governments. But these Itoke-led governments operate a system that was put in place by the British colonial government. In particular, the land canvas system that created the leasing arrangement. That is just not a, you know, when you look at the land tenure system in Fiji, it's just not a land tenure system. It's the economic foundation upon which the post-colonial state is anchored upon. And any attempt to reform that will run the, 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 the possibility, will run the risk of compromising the economic survival of the state. So when you are prime minister and members of cabinet, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to tweet this, the land tenure system. Because the last thing you want is the economy to collapse in front of you. Mm. And so, you know, uh, um, that is the, the, the situation of indigenous regions. The very thing that secures the economic survival of the state, the sugar industry, real estate development, tourism, uh, you know, all kinds of manufacturing sectors that are you know, built on Fijian land. The very thing that secures the economic survival of the state is precisely, is in and of itself, the very thing that systematically dispossesses, excluded, and marginalized the indigenous people. Okay, what's the connection between that and the Maoris? One of the things about, you know, uh, uh, about Maori care is that you have a people who are, you know, when you look at the history of, of, of the, you know, the taking over of Hawaii, the queen herself pleaded with the people not to fight. That, that was a, a very historical moment, you know, uh, Queen Lily of Kalani, when the kingdom was seized, appealed to her people not to fight. And so it took a long while for the Maori, for the Kanaka Maori, the native Hawaiians, to realize that, you know, it's time for us to assert ourselves. Mauna Kea, to me, is a reflection of the evolution of a people, the evolution of self-determination, that they will have to be visible, the fight to be visible, the fight to assert, and the fight to protect the things that matters for them, or perhaps to protect what is left of the heritage. And to me, Marikea is important in terms of envisioning, you know, a people in Fiji, you know, the indigenous people of Fiji, because we indigenous people right now they are yet to recognize that they've been dispossessed. That is, that is where, you know, Fiji is in the hierarchy of critical colonial discussion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and so, um, the, the, the Mauna Kea, you know, is really a story of a people who have asserted themselves where we've walked. And, uh, and, 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 um, and Fiji, the Itauke of Fiji as we speak suffer from you know, the loss of economic sovereignty. They've taken away land for economic development and they've put indigenous Fijians in the marginal spaces. That's what the land tenure system does and continue to do. Right? They put in place an inst in this entire institution. There was an entire institution that was put in place by the British colonial government to administer the leasing arrangement. There were only two places in the Pacific that had land registration, land re the mapping of land. They map land, they register the land, and that was Fiji and Hawaii. Very recently, we have Samoa who have just had passed the Land Registration Act. But for a long time, Fiji and Hawaii were the only two other Pacific Island countries that have had land registration, but two different results. In Hawaii, they lost their land because they were able to sell it. In the case of Fiji, the British put in place a principle called non the inalienable rights, the principle of inalienability, that you cannot sell the land. They protect the Tauke land. You can't sell it, but you can only lease it. 
And that is a principle that has sort of camouflaged, you know, the taking away of the land. <coughs> because indigenous people say, wow, we cannot tell you. Look at the Maoris that lost the land, Australian Aborigines lost the conducts of nuclear Italy, Native American Indians. Yay, we still have our land protected. It's not as, you know, benevolent as it looks from the outside. Because Fiji was colonized in 1874. Remember, the British entered the colonial enterprise in, in 1601. When you look at the trajectory, the historical trajectory of colonization, from 1492 to 1950, when the United Nations put in place the Declaration of the Colonization Act, the British entered the colonial race in 1601. So after centuries of colonization, Fiji was one of the last colonies that they colonized. They have learned the art of colonization. Mm. They have learned the art of taking away land without causing bloodshed. They have learned the art of creating the illusion that land is yours. Mm. When in fact land has been taken away. And so to me, Mauna Kea is a story that you know, indigenous Fijians can learn from to learn from the people who have recognized you know, that it is time for them to assert themselves, to assert, to assert their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and today, you know, as we share, as I listen to the story from the Maoris, uh, the stories from Native American Indians, you know, I wish that indigenous Indians would be here to hear these kinds of stories. Because, you know, if you tell us, this is, this is, this is one of the, the challenges, one of the heart-breaking, you know, reflections that I suffer from, I suffer from this, and that indigenous Fijians don't know that their land, they have been dispossessed of their land. The, the notion of, of colonial benevolence is so entrenched in the curriculum, in the Fijian culture. You know, for a long time, after 1970, when you go to villages, rural villages, you will see the big portraits of the monarchs, <laughs> like this, they put big ones in the village. They celebrate colonization. And I think that is one of the, one of the, you know, the biggest predicaments of colonization. At least for those who, who knew that they were dispossessed, colonized, oppressed, marginalized, all kinds of evisceration, at least you are already on a better position. Think of indigenous Fijians who do not know that they were, you know, eviscerated. That's the art of British colonization. It speaks to you know, the politics of British colonialism, the politics of British colonial policies, the ability to craft a system where you take away land without indigenous, you know, indigenous people recognize that their land has been taken away. I hope that some of these reflections will help us as we, uh, as we think about common experiences of dispossession in the economic marginalization. Thank you. So we have some good time for conversation. Mm -hmm. Let people make comments, ask mm -hmm. questions. Yes. In uh, 1962, I lived for a short time in New Zealand, mm -hmm. in the middle of South Island, mm -hmm. in a place called Oamaru. Oh, wow. wow. Which I'm told wow. that that's where they, when they want old fashioned pictures, they take them there. Uh, <laughs> and I was the only brown person that, well, people just stared at me. I go to a movie and they just stared at me through the whole movie. And it, it kind of got, made me kind of crazy. <laughs> and, um, I asked somebody, why do, they pe why do people stare at me all the time? And said, oh, well, they think you're Maori. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I'm Alaskan. <laughs> uh, but I've been looking for the Maoris. Where are they? <laughs> and this is the way I've been, hearing, I've been hearing from these different parts of the globe what they said to me. They said, oh, well, they're not here. Uh, they're up north. They don't like the cold. <laughs> and I couldn't help myself. I said, well, it was nice of them to name everything before they left. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they found out I was Alaskan, then all bets were off. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much for surviving all Amaru and Nikes. You <laughs> look fabulous for it. <laughs> Everybody here was dressing like Jacqueline Kennedy. They were dressing like the Queen Mother. <laughs> 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 I'd like to think we've moved some way since 1962, hmm. and on a good day, I'm Australian company that wants to call this Australian honey, Manuka honey, they can't even say it right, and when he was interviewed, he said, but, but nobody owns it, I'm like, dude, that's my language, <laughs> that somebody has turned into a billion dollar mm. brand, mm, which yeah. now a bunch of other countries want to use. Mm -hmm. I mean, call it your own, up your own First Nation. You know, I mean, say so this whole notion of progress every now and again, you feel like you've got movement forward, and then you stub your toe and realize, actually not so much. <laughs> well, and part of colonization is the right to name. Right, yeah. It's the right to name, yes. Yeah. yes. And to have that acknowledged. I, I started uh, about 25 years ago uh, on a little journey which I've called Deconstructing the Colonization of My Mind. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I've come to the conclusion it's a life's work. <laughs> okay? But 25 years ago, I, th I still thought to be tall, slim, and white with blonde hair was the epitome of beauty. Yeah. Just little bits of deconstruction. You know, on a daily basis. Now I've realized God rewarded me by making me a short brown woman in a culture where short brown old women are venerated. It's a win. <laughs> Sorry. Did you have some? <laughs> So you know we have this uh, this uh, this symposium coming up, and uh, Sarah and I are completely finished with our presentation. Yeah, we are yeah, ready. <laughs> um, so but, ready. But but for our people, the the, the yaki, the yoema, the hiyaki, whoever you ask, it all kind of changes. Mm -hmm. um, but in our in our spirituality, our religiosity, our religion, our hybrid of Catholicism and our traditional ways, and it's a long story. Um, uh, there's our traditional belief systems that have uh, the different worlds that we come from and the little people that existed before we became human and all these different things, but there are words and, and, and titles and names of these things that nobody knows, unless you're Yaki. Nobody knows about the Seyahun uh, Aniya or the, the, the Yoaniya, the, you know, the enchanted world, the flower world, these other places, these other worlds, unless you're Yaki, because who cares? Or you're gonna read about it and you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And so there's be, because uh, one of the things for me is like looking at history and looking at spellings and words. And you know, of course, we're using English letters to spell our language. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking up uh, some of these things on the on the internet, and I came across an album that's titled the Huya Ania, which is one of our worlds. And this album was on this, you know, there was a campaign to, you know, fundraise um, for this album to produce it for $5,000. And I'm like looking at all the names of the songs and the name of the album and all this other stuff. And I'm like, I don't think any of these names are supposed to be used for a musical album. I, what do you mm. So I looked at who was doing it. It's some, can I say, Pacquiao? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, non native yeah. over in Texas, I think. And they're, raising money to build this album and, and they're like doing little tours and stuff so I took uh, some kind of you know spiritual advice from my auntie over here and I'm like hey how you doing so uh, why are you using those words that are our religious words in your album just wondering <laughs> so I haven't heard back from him yet but uh, I just found, I just found this yesterday just I found this yesterday. Appropriation is the next big struggle for mm -hmm. First Nations peoples because um, whilst it was bad at the time when we were savages, it's even scarier now that we're a little bit cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've, I've had the privilege of working with a Native American um, woman who wrote a story about, is it the Pemberton? Pendleton. 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 That's it. Um, how this was a, a, a design that was originally co 
produced with mm -hmm. First Nations people mm -hmm. for special events and in the last few years it's become trendy and now Native Americans can't afford them anymore mm -hmm. because they're like thousands of dollars for one of these blankets which celebrate Geronimo and, mm -hmm. and, and I guess the, the next generation of well, the next iteration of our struggle um, is around cop. Like, I, I mean, I was just saying to you, I, I, I bought a. I don't usually when I go through duty free, but I bought a bottle of gin <laughs> in duty free on my way here, only because it had written on it indigenous, mm. and then it had a Maori type design. Now, I've I've never seen this gin for sale in New Zealand. It may be just something that's marketed internationally. Yeah. Uh, and then when I looked, I looked for consultation with or co, you know, some kind of partnership with them. That first name. No, uh, the design was by somebody called Juice from Tattooist from Porirua. And I'm like, so we will sample it. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, we had gin at the hotel. But um, one of the one of the things I've got to do when I go home is hunt yeah. these people down. <laughs> and have the hard conversation yeah, exactly. about where did you get the right, right, right. of this name and this label and this right. brand mm. and mm. why are you not trying to sell it in mainstream New Zealand stores because you know why you'd have to deal with people like us. Mm. So, 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 so it's, <clears throat> yes, the, the struggle for economic sovereignty and political sovereignty are really important, but that struggle for cultural sovereignty yeah. is, is right there on the... On the mm. Mm. Mm agenda as well and being able to do them simultaneously without without just dying of exhaustion <laughs> is, yeah. you young ones hmm. oh. <laughs> 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 you young ones <laughs> well I, I think the what that brings up the renaming I mean we talk about all kinds of these these lovely sports teams here in America um, oh. but the renaming strictly is like visibility, yeah. you know. So even in Hawaii, some of the traditional uh, I don't know what you this the the land divisions that they have, uh, yeah. uh -huh. uh -huh. those they're starting to put signs up showing what they are. And and even though most people go by and they're just like, wait, this is Kona. I thought that was on the Big Island, but I'm in Kauai. Um, it's huh. just visibility mm -hmm. because that's what starts the conversation to even go into economic exactly. and. I could not agree more. I mean, for us coming in, and thank you so much to Eddie and Sarah for taking us and showing us the art at the at the uh, airport mm. to be able to see those beautiful images. Uh, for me, that was the best part of arriving was being able to see these people and stories and names. Um, so yeah, it, it's not all doom and gloom. We can't we can't let you know the vicissitudes wear us down mm. we have to yeah. take heart from the little victories the signs the the pictures the renaming the acknowledgements um all of those for me are uh indicative of of movement mm. Mm. and that's a good thing yeah. i'd like to uh, comment on the issue of uh, cultural sovereignty uh, i think this is something that we don't often talk about a lot in our discussions I think probably we talk about it, but in the framing it differently. Mm. To me, this sounds meaningful to me, the cultural sovereignty. Because our cultures have been, you know, usurped. Yeah. It has been stolen. Words, mula from Fiji. It becomes, mula is a very significant word. It, it's loaded. Mula is when I say mula to you. It's like aloha, I say mula to you. Mula literally means, literally means life. So I, I say, Mula, I give you life. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now, you know, uh, it's, now you have a restaurant called Mula. Mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, in, uh, somewhere in California, but you know, we, we raised that up and I don't know what happened to that. But it's the, you know, appropriation of, of cultures and, 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 and language. And, and I think when we talk about uh, you know, approaches, when we're thinking of the multiple approaches of appropriating cultural sovereignty, we have to navigate our ways, you know, uh, navigate our ways around you know, uh, the ways in which words and cultures are, 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 are usurped. How do we deal with that? How do we reappropriate those things again? 
like Aloha. You become so, you know, commercialized that you just lost it. You know, you, you, the, the meaning becomes dissipated. You know, and that is something about capitalism and colonialism. It's devoid of any kind of respect and any kind of, uh, you know, uh, meaning on the things that we hold dear. You know, um, yeah, and, and I think this is this is an important discussion. How do we navigate ourselves around this? Because you know, the capitalist and, and let me say this again: that the capitalist economic system. This is an economic system that thrives, you know, on the exploitation of natural resources. Mm -hmm. The result of which we are now confronted with, which is the existential threat of climate change. That's one. Two is you know the exploitation of human resources, from which you know resulted in slavery, and from which we are still trying to recover from. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and of course the capitalist economic system thrives on the rule of law that privileges the white in everything else about being white, at the expense of people of color. And so within that context, you know, anything and everything that they can, that they can take to commercialize, to, to feed that economic system. They do, unfettedly. There is no sense of, you know, stopping. And so, I mean, we're dealing with a very aggressive system, and we need to be aggressive. Thank you. I'm so glad the whole issue of cultural sovereignty has come up, and I agree, it's so central. And yet, you know, economic sovereignty, like you said, how can you, you know, sleep during the day? I mean, there's just, or during the night, there's so much to do with economic sovereignty, territorial sovereignty, political sovereignty, cultural sovereignty. And I've been very um, honored and blessed and maybe <laughs> naive and courageous to work with a lot of California Native communities. Um, locally, um, our dear alum here, uh, Monique, is uh, Shumash. And um, a lot of the intra-tribal conflict that I've witnessed and experienced um, as an ally to Native California Indian people, as a visitor on their lands, and with my own tribe a little bit too, the Anishinaabe, is the, the duality, the perceived duality between cultural sovereignty and political or economic sovereignty. Yeah, yeah. For example, mm -hmm. some leadership in communities really feel that you know they need their political recognition mm -hmm. from the government, the mm -hmm. government, and that's their number one priority. And kind of everything else is has to be subservient to that one goal because it takes everything to try to get political recognition. Whereas others, it's economic. So if they're already recognized, you can get a casino or you can do a golf course. Yeah. A lot of California federally recognized tribes do these resorts and golf courses and have played mm -hmm. the, the capitalistic yeah. game very yeah. well and can make a lot of money. And then it's often you know these kind of side groups that are politically disenfranchised from their own tribes who are keeping the language alive, who are bringing back the canoe traditions, mm -hmm. who are trying to keep the, the foods and the, the health traditions alive. And so there's often intra-tribal conflict I see um, between those different assertions of sovereignty. So I just would love to hear any reflections, comments. I'm always impressed when I go to Aotearoa how I don't see it, maybe as an outsider, um, but you've embraced your entrepreneurialness and your economic savvy with a lot of really sophisticated economic work and yet are so culturally you know, uh, yeah. sovereign. So just throwing out some other ideas for the conversation here and would love all of your reflections on that, including Dr. Barker. And I, I think the, the thing you've raised is really interesting because I know this was an issue but some of the people I, I knew who were around Mona Care, um, you know, there was there was a, a debate within the Native Hawaiian mm, community mm, mm, about mm. the level of support for mm. the occupation and the activism. Not not openly critical, but 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 real debate about um, the ways of moving forward and working with the project, which I thought was interesting. The last images I showed. Um, in the little reel I had were at a place called Ebumato, which is an occupation that 
has been going on for the last two or three years. And again, within the Māori community and within the tribe, there is a debate which has spilled over into open verbal conflict. Yeah. So I think the question you raise is really interesting, that what may happen as you pursue cultural sovereignty is that factions within your world begin to define your culture. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, in some cases, that capacity to do that is often, as you talked about, uh, given to you by the colonizer who picks the people they want to do business with. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not in any way criticizing the people who choose to go on that journey, but it creates real tension within our world because you see those are the Māori who've got the resources and those are the ones who don't. Those are the Hawaiians who have access to power. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it almost is a new manifestation, manifestation. Of, of, of 21st century yeah. colonisation. Yeah. That, 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 that sort of um, defining who is the inner circle mm -hmm. to be able to decide, you know, and this is a conflict that's going on in the Māori world. It's, it's, an, it's just a little aside, but there are some Māori uh, who would argue that you're not a proper Māori unless you can speak the Māori language. Mm. And in our latest census, only less than... We have that too. We have that, you got to that. You know what I mean? Um, and so, so that is actually turning some Māori up. You know, we don't want to... We've, we've had enough surviving white exactly. people. Yeah. But I don't want to survive us as well. I'd rather just go off and be Greek. It's exhausting being indigenous. I tell you. <laughs> so, 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 you know, stealing yeah. ourselves for those kinds of issues is yeah. is as much a part of the the twenty first century mm. landscape as the trauma of mm, previous right. centuries. Mm. Like I said, it's kind of exhausting being it's indigenous. <laughs> You know, in the case of Fiji, as I said earlier, uh, we have political, you know, sovereignty. Uh, but uh, so, you know, fundamentally, economically debilitated, the villages where indigenous Fiji live is is um, is uh, a constitutive of economically debilitated spaces. What I mean by that is this. Uh, they divide the land when they did. It took 60 years for the British colonial government to register the land. It was a very complex process because they were just not registering the land. They were recreating the social political structure of indigenous people in society. That was essential to land registration because of the complexity of the land system. Anyway, that's a different idea. But, but the thing is, you know. Um, the least land, this is the economically progressive land. Because you lease the land, you have private property rights away. You can use it to lease, to, to, to secure loans. You can use it for all kinds of economic development, social economic advancement. But the, 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 the marginal spaces where indigenous Fijian live, you cannot lease it. So you can build a 10-story house on that land, it is not constitutive of an asset. The indigenous people are assetless people because they live in spaces that cannot be recognized both by the court and by the international, by, by the, the modern economy. If I go to the bank and say, this, I, this is my village, I want to loan $10,000 to plant, you know, uh, do some kind of commercial agriculture. I said, okay, that's fine, do you have a lease? No, I come from the village, you can't lease. Mm. Yeah, then, therefore, you cannot secure this loan. Mm. This is the economic reality of indigenous regions, the marginal. So, talking about political sovereignty, how do you reconcile political sovereignty and economic sovereignty? You know, or political yeah. sovereignty yeah. and economic underdevelopment? That's, right. mm. 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 That's the pride of Fijian situation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And on that chirpy note. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make an observation? Perhaps a chirpy one. And I began her presentation with a song. Mm. And songs, particularly written by our women, have perhaps 
an historic analogy, largely um, painted by the history of the Greeks and the Trojans. The Greeks learned to their um, What am I trying to say? We can either accept that we've been colonized and we can get mad, or we can reject that we've been colonized and get even. <laughs> <laughs> and I acknowledge the work, particularly of Ella's generation, our, our female generation. Ella showed a number of very, very important female activists. Mm. But activism doesn't always have to come behind a gun. Mm. It is often said that the pen is mightier than the sword. But mm. for many of those very, very gentle, but very, very important moments in New Zealand history, when a woman, a Maori woman, an elderly Maori woman, chose to walk from the far north to Wellington mm. to make a point, it was another Maori woman who chose to be vilified for a brief period of time, she should be sanctified, to sing the New Zealand national anthem in our first language for the first time. Yes, <coughs> And I want to make you all to acknowledge that the woman in the film that you showed us, the woman in this room, but more importantly, the generation of women that, Mar that Ella represents, yeah. Because all I can say is, God forbid that gin company when Ella gets hung. <laughs> <laughs> because Ella's activism will either come at the end of her tongue, not at the end of her fingertips. And if there's one thing, perhaps, to characterise indigenous reoccupation, mm -hmm. whether it be the reoccupation of our language, the reoccupation of our culture, the reoccupation of our own minds, if not our own sovereignty. And coming back to one of the points that you make, because I've really despair at the sort of politicisation of the um, what we used to refer to as the binary between the gay and lesbian communities both here in um, America and in, and in New Zealand where we end up with an alphabet soup. <laughs> we are not each other's enemies. Mm. Right. We are each other's allies, mm. irrespective of where we might live. Because ultimately it's our future generations which will which will judge us on the most useful pieces of information actually provided by running Walker's son, Michael, is that as an academic, we must always be careful how we treat our students because they will always sit in judgment upon us. And our students don't always have to be those students we have in institutions like this because the students of life often as not will judge us quite harshly, I mm -hmm. think, as Greta Thunberg and, mm -hmm. and her generation are. But I really do want to um, just acknowledge the work of our and her generation, our female generation, mm -hmm. who are not timid, mm -hmm. who are not weak, who in many instances don't know the meaning of the word no, mm -hmm. but more importantly, just simply quietly recolonised, often as not through humour and through song, the culture that we often as not proclaim that we are. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to say that being, you know, at, um, standing off in Marquia, the difference there was at Marquia they do their protocol, they're singing their prayers mm -hmm. three times a day, well, four really, because you're morning um, um, Sunday, and that had a more powerful effect, you know, that, so re-spiritualizing, I think, is, mm -hmm. is where we need to be, mm -hmm. um, because I know at, at Standing Rock, the elders kept saying spiritual, spiritual, and the young people and the outsiders that came in had a different view of what they wanted. So yeah. it, it more militarized and the elders kept saying, this is the problem, this is why we're having these things happen to us. Um, but at Mount it was very different to experience. Um, and it was more uplifting. And the education that went on there, um, not just watching or being a part of uh, the ceremony, but even the workshops that were done, uh, a very different feeling. I came away from there um, feeling much different from at when visiting yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I think there's that, I mean, I, I, I know the term soul food sounds kind of trite, but I know from my own experience that when we gather, even in a small mm. gathering like this, there's a little bit of food for the soul yes. um, that you often don't realise until you walk away from it how uplifting it has been. 
Um, I'm starting to use terms, I know it's a terrible term, but I, I can't think of another one, like cultural capital. You know, we talk about economic capital, um, but I think there's something that manifests when Indigenous people get together that is about feeding our souls, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as our minds. But, but it's that soul food that gets you through the dark days. Yeah. My new term is cultural privilege. You know, I'm privileged as a, as a indigenous yes. woman because of my knowledge yes. that yes. most people Absolutely. don't have my knowledge experience. <coughs> yeah, that's significant. Privilege. And I think teaching our young people, as well as you know, older people, um, you know, re-indigenizing them, because that's what we're gonna win on. When our when our people are colonized, uh, the the conquer divide, that division stays and we're fighting each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we're successful in re-indigenizing, you know, um, our, our own people, then we have those allies, you know, and we're stronger in that way so that we can all go in prayer. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking about um, some of the, I was in Hawaii last week and at the American Studies Association and one of the plenary panels was um, organized with the community. So Noe Noe Silva, Noe Lani Goodyear and other uh, professors from UH were there, but uh, Pua Case was there. She's one of the um, auntie <laughs> aunties at Mauna Kea, right? She's and and so she was she was talking about how um, you know the, the the struggle with this telescope yeah. is um, they're real friendly uh, the astronomers when they want to learn from uh, Kanaka Mali around, right, constellations mm -hmm. and yeah. all this kind of stuff. So they want the knowledge, but um, she kept saying, they don't want our wisdom <laughs> about what it means, <laughs> right, right? to live in that place. So they want, you know, they want the, they want the gin <laughs> <laughs> with the label, they want, they want, you know, they want a, the the kitsch. They want they turn our culture into kitsch. That's what they want. Yeah. Um, so I keep thinking about that, and I also think it could, this is this is part of where I am with my work is that we really do need to decolonize our understandings of decolonization. <laughs> wow, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think? Right because right when we start talking about returning to the land as an occupation. Like, what is that? What is that? Yeah. What is that? Um, I call it going home. I call it return. I think about Dr. Nelson um, gave a presentation, what was it, 10 or 15 years ago when you were talking about um, rematriation. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Sigourte Land Trust mm -hmm. talks about rematriating the land. Um, I think about that language as opposed to this language of oh, occupation. Oh, rematriate. Wow. Right? Wow. Rematriate the land. Wow. Um, as a return, as a reclaiming, not as a occupation. occupation. And that um, uh, we need to refuse this language, right? Because the language serves the state. It doesn't help us get, it doesn't help us communicate with each other, and it doesn't help us get where we need to be. Um, or to, you know, sort of articulate a political agenda that doesn't sound happiness. Um, yeah, some thoughts. Yeah, that was beautiful. That's a new, new word. So, Pinamia, thank you. This has been a wonderful, wonderful talk. I was in um, Hawaii last year, teaching at Hawaii Community College. And I remember that the people locally were saying, uh, to me, and I was actually teaching world history and for some strange reason, Native Hawaiian history, history even though I'm not Native Hawaiian, some mixed indigenous. I didn't really mm -hmm. want to talk about me at all, but it's hard to avoid that, you know what I mean? But a lot of the people there at the time, um, like the Howleys, even local Howleys, you know, were saying that, um, oh, it's like they just started, you know, 
protesting. And it's like, no, this has been going on for a long time, a very long time. Uh, it's not something new. It's just now. So if they have, in the beginning, during the indigenous renaissance, I love that we, we brought that up, you know, the renaissance that happened in, in parallel streams and networks like a spider web at, you know, around a similar time. Um, if they had approached the Kanaka Mali as outsiders, as visitors, and humbled themselves, yeah. sitting back in the 1800s, mm -hmm. he was doing everything he could to keep his people alive. Yeah. I think we come from a long line of troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> because if we were not troublemakers, we would not exist. We would be like maybe hundreds of cultures that would have simply disappeared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I know when I'm in a room with other First Nations people, I can literally feel the resilience in us. And that's part of the, 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 the cultural revitalization that, that, mm -hmm. that gets me through the rough patches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Alice Dean. I know she's a troublemaker. He's my boss. <laughs> I'm not her boss. So if I was her boss, she must do as she told. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that. Strike that from the camera. I know, I know. So says Joanne Barker and Melissa Nelson. I'm hearing a little echo happening on this side of the room over here. <laughs> uh. You know, the perhaps the, the the desire to have the colonial encounter, a romantic encounter, where mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Europeans come and kneel in front of the kind of around you. Only have indigenous people who have met. But that was not how the colonial as we all know. That was not how the colonial encounter was uh, take place. Because the colonial encounter was always, amongst other things, predicated on contempt of the natives. So mm -hmm. there is no way they're going to come and deal. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, can you teach me this? No, you know, it was yeah. predicated on you know, military might and the contempt yeah. of the natives. No, I was talking about with the, when they first were going to put up the actual physical telescope. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. Yeah. right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah that, that would be real, though. That yeah. would be uh, interesting. I mean, that would be nice, but it yeah. can happen. We'll let you feel good. But they just right. want the yeah. knowledge, yeah. want the wisdom, you know. Right. So I have, a, I have a question for you and then for, for everyone. Um, the second part of our title today is The Future of Us. Mm. So um, can you speak a little bit about, uh, the, there's this whole new way of talking about indigenous futurisms or futurity or claiming the future, right? Like what is that in the context of our histories of opposition? Um, what is that for you as scholars and cultural producers? Yeah, okay, yeah. so my most important job in the yes. world yeah is being the mother of my three daughters. Mm -hmm. um, I was born into a world that did not value me as a Maori woman, as a Maori and a woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for my sins, produced three women <laughs> who have grown up to be strong, brave, extraordinarily proud of all of the facets of who they are. So their white side's not allowed to pick on their brown side and their brown side's not allowed to pick on their white side because they love all their sides. Yeah. I call them my caramellos. You don't have caramello chocolate <laughs> in this country, but it's a mix of brown and white chocolate. Oh, yeah. I think you have a thingy here, yeah, yeah. but we have caramel because we were colonized by the English. And, they yeah. <laughs> um, and so my children are my hope for the future uh, because when you're a parent, you have to believe in the future. And that I balance against the fact that by 2030, the planet may be inhospitable. Mm -hmm. That's a very real possibility, and I'm deeply ashamed to have been part of the generation that created that. Mm -hmm. 
mm. that, that planet and that potential future. But if you ask me about the future of us as an Indigenous woman, um, my greatest source of pride is being the mother of these extraordinary human beings. Mm. That's my real day job. Yeah. And they give me hope for the future. And they still talk to me, which is an added bonus. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> to me, as, as an indigenous Indian, uh, yes. when I think about the future, I focus on, on our people. And uh, the, the vision is, is a synthesis, the, the coming together of both an, an indigenous Fijian who is uh, who is grounded in the culture, in the genealogies, and everything else that is constituted, constituted of being an indigenous person, and at the same time economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we cannot, um, as much as we critique the capitalist economic system, as much as we demonize it, you know, we, you and I, you know, participate in and we have to try to navigate ourselves around it. And mm -hmm. that is where, you know, uh, education for social justice becomes important uh, in envisioning a future for indigenous people, not just for the EWK, but also for Pacific Islanders, including the Maoris and the Native American Indians as well. And so, uh, to me, it's a synthesis of one who is grounded in indigeneity and uh, one who's also, you know, uh, economically empowered as well, in, in ways that, uh, you know, um, build bridges across indigenous people. Uh, you get empowered and you can empower others as well, indigenous groups as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, education plays an important role. How do we do that? How do we create an indigenous person who is grounded in his indigeneity or her indigeneity and also become economically empowered as well? How do we how do we do that? Uh, and it's sort of the, uh, the struggle that is uh, thinking about you know thinking about the you know, I'm here as part of the uh, group to establish the Pacific Studies at the San Francisco State yeah. to uh, to cater for Pacific Islanders in the Bay Area. These are some of the people who I know. Pacific Islanders are marginalized in the press in all kinds of ways. And and and, and so. Um, one of the things that I struggle with is that you know, some of the Pacific Islanders, you know, uh, forgive me for saying this, they, they, they do not know how to speak their language. And to me as an indigenous person, that is so important to me, to be able to speak my language. Mm -hmm. Because inherent, deposited in my language is the whole epistemology. Mm -hmm. That when I don't know how to speak it, I forfeit everything else about who I am. Mm. And so, you know, how do you, and so, like, thinking about you know, empowering indigenous Pacific Islanders in the diaspora, you know, uh, I'm thinking along this line, you know, yeah. economic empowerment, indigeneity, how do you synthesize it as a new vision? How do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. What about others, other thoughts? Yeah. I, I'm so, so thankful that this was brought up, and it, it really, to me, brings together a couple of things that we talked about the last hour. We are talking about cultural, political, and economic sovereignty for indigenous peoples. Now, if you're mixed diasporic, like you're not in your traditional homelands, you're in an urban center, and you're trying to do all three of those as this these separate entities, and your traditional and cultural sovereignty is incapable of taking in the political and economic. Like, I know plenty of relatives and elders who are doing this right now. Soul stealing, as far as the camera. And how do we, so this question is big on my mind, than all of these things. And it really, it, it comes back to decolonizing us completely, right? Re-indigenizing everything, decolonizing our mind, because we created these separate sovereignties within these three different ways. So we have to reclaim all those and put them under one umbrella of identity, yeah. mm -hmm. place making, mm -hmm. all these things so that it's not separate games yes. that we're playing where it's, yeah. we can be yeah. economically successful, we can work in the world over and we can be modern, we can be technologically advanced, and we can be indigenous at the yeah. same time. 
But what does that look like? Because when I walk down the street, I don't see my language. I don't talk to people in my language. Mm -hmm. People don't know who, what I'm even in. They're like, he's like probably Mexican or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a huge question. And the thing she brought about indigenous futurism is just like the ability to think it through. They're like, okay, what's it going to look like in 100 right. years? I'd like to uh, address that uh, ability to think it through. Oh, here we go. You know, my ancestors uh, in one direction are in, from the Andes, uh, specifically Bolivia, and mm -hmm. currently <clears throat> there's a major crisis mm -hmm. in Bolivia that I think largely is, there's a lot of factors in play and um, one of the biggest tragedies that I have seen and heard people that I trust that are currently there and living there name is the lack of indigenous futurist imagination that Evo Morales and the mass and mm -hmm. the populist left-wing Andean socialist imagination was unable to think of how to have economic sovereignty without extractivist right. uh, right. methodologies mm -hmm. of damming and right. cutting the forest mm -hmm. and trampling indigenous people's rights yeah. with roads yeah. through indigenous yeah. territories without consultation and without mafioso caudillo mm -hmm. chief style I mean like you know this Latin American macho not indigenous but Latin <laughs> uh, <laughs> style of um, anyone who opposes my point of view, you're out. Mm -hmm. And the, the social movements were completely eviscerated by that, and they eventually came and uh, came back to say that this is fraud, and this is not indigenous. Mm -hmm. And that has created a political situation in which all that sovereignty has been undermined, and now the right wing is coming in, and the recolonization and racism and the ugliest fascist sides yeah. are able to come back, and that disaster capitalism is moving in hardcore because of a lack of indigenous futurist imagination of how can we be socially, politically, and economically sovereign in a truly indigenous way moving forward into the future. Yeah. That was such a beautiful metaphor that you said about the umbrella. Oh, you said it. <laughs> I have this sort of an anecdote. So I took hula for about three years, and my kumuhula um, studied under George Nalbe. Okay. Yeah. And her husband, she's, she's African American. She was one of the only non native Hawaiians to be gifted to become a kumuhula. Uh, her name is Lisa Tula Saunders. And her husband, they faced a lot of sort of racism right here in the Bay Area. Her husband is an underground contractor. And so he was always kept out of these big contracts because it's pretty much white control. But uh, a Fijian woman met him on the bus when he was down and out. And she, they made friendship, and she invited him to Fiji. Um, and he's been working with the government there, that whole, the Ohana, the family, to bring back a sustainable forest. I forget where. And it's supposed to be, I don't know how it works, the intricate details of it, but the, the idea is that it's indigenous Kajina, mm -hmm. it's self-managed, it's forest, mm -hmm. sustainable harvesting, mm -hmm. and all these things, and so it's economic. Yeah. So anyway, it just made me think of, of that, your question. Mm -hmm. What are the opportunities to and there are so many opportunities. I, I guess I don't know, um, I don't know how whether this is a word term used much here, but um, I think my planet's biggest threat our planet's biggest threat at the moment is neoliberal thinking. Mm. The, the notion that um, growth 
can be exponential. Yeah. The idea that exploitation is economic good. Um, and in my country, the way that was translated was the the selling off of a significant amount of the mm -hmm. arms of the state. Now, keep in mind, I come from a country where universal access to healthcare and education has been a norm for most of the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. And that was unpicked in the 1980s. And the impacts for Māori have been catastrophic. So the recolonization of us, the re-impoverishment of us has happened through you know, neoliberal um, economic philosophy. And for me, that's the enemy. Mm -hmm. rather than individual peoples yeah. or countries or mm -hmm. cultures is a philosophy that I genuinely believe is destroying this planet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because in my theology, this planet is my mother, yeah. you know, I come out of her and I'm going to go back into her one day and my father is the sky because we're all made of stardust, as we well know. So, you know, that's my religion. <laughs> Um, then I had this real abiding fear mm. uh, that the politics of greed, you know, which I mean, I'm, I'm, I know Morales came into his, his, his tenure from the media thinking I, I can make a difference. Um, just as we have uh, the biggest number of Māori politicians ever in a New Zealand government in my country right now, who all probably had those same noble aspirations. I've met Canadian First Nation politicians who were, you know, road to hell's paid with good intentions, but anyway. Um, and I just am concerned that the machinery of politics and power and greed mm. Mm. Uh, make, make those, those good intentions almost uh, impossible to achieve. Mm. Um, so that's why gatherings like this, albeit small or large, are really critical if we go back out into our communities and, you know, take control of the narrative, take control of the brand. We know there's a teeny tiny window of coolness about us as Indigenous folks. Let's build the narrative and the story. Mm. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure out, like, I belong to this thing that's part of the Academy of Management, and eventually we had so many titles for us that we became the Native Aboriginal Indigenous First Nations Caucus. Because, <laughs> because we wanted to cover every corner of our patch, you know what I mean? <laughs> really long acronym. Yeah, another alphabet soup. <laughs> but at least it's our alphabet soup. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I honestly believe that, that cultural, political, economic sovereignty are only impossible if we accept mm -hmm. um, the terms from a colonial framework. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that uh, economic sovereignty is not capitalism mm -hmm. in di with an indigenous label yes. on it, right? Yeah. 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 We're talking about a very, I, I've been writing about this a lot lately that when we talk about the land, we are not talking about property. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about something very different. And so, um, but I, I genuinely believe that um, this is the decolonization of our decolonization, which is, yeah. we've got to stop thinking about these things as incompatible. Um, that that uh, they're only incompatible if you buy into, right, what the state is telling you is possible, um, which is that you have to choose, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, F that model of sovereignty. I, I refuse to accept that. Um, so I, I, I want to offer my deep one, this she, my deep thanks to both of you for your good teachings today. And I want to actually, um, we have some bags, uh, shopping bags, to invite the Mari who we are hosting to take food back to your Aww. hotel room <laughs> um, so that you have little snacks. Snacks are good. Yes, snacks are with very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, to have with your gin. Uh, and thank you all for being here um, and working with us through these, these very important things. So, thank you so much.